Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where I cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and it's the 15th of July, 2024. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So I have a bullish rant lined up for you guys today, but before I get into that, I did want to make a little bit of an announcement here that on August 10th or from August 10th, for around two and a half months, I'm going to be traveling around Europe. Now that means that your regular cadence of refuels is going to be greatly interrupted. I'm not going to take the entire two and a half months off of the refuel, but I feel like I'm probably only going to be able to do like one episode a week. Uh, at, at, you know, it's going to be hard to schedule to do an episode when I'm traveling uh, and when I'm you know doing a lot of different things while I'm in Europe. And also the time zone is going to be different to the normal times that I record the refuel out and the normal times that I put the refuel live. So there's going to be a bit of, I guess, a disruption there in terms of when you're usually used to watching and listening to the refuel. But I don't plan, as I said, to take off the whole two and a half months there. It'll probably be about once a week. Uh, and it might be, might be more frequent than that, just depending on if there's big news or not. Like if there's something major that happens, I'll probably make some time or try to make some time to do an episode on that day. But we're going to be uh, basically moving a lot. So I'm going with my fiance, of course, just, uh, just the two of us. Two and a half months, we're going to be uh, moving around uh, through mostly Western Europe. We're not going to any of the uh, and into the uh, countries like the, the Nordic countries, like Norway and, and Sweden or anything like that. We're not going towards the Eastern Europe. We're mainly staying in Western Europe, but we are basically traveling, starting in London and going a, around in a circle and basically spending most of the time in Italy. We're both uh, of Italian heritage. We've never been to Italy, so we're re very much looking forward to that. But it basically means that it's going to be very, very hard for me to record any refills. But I will try to do one uh, at least once a week. Of course, from now until August 10th, I will definitely try to uh, stick to the regular cadence of Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes. Uh, until then, just, yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to do rug fuels, but they happen, of course. Uh, and I think August 10th is actually a Saturday. So it'll be from like August 9th, which is the Friday. And then from there, as I said, I'll try to do an episode once a week. I'm, I'm not going to leave you guys hanging for two and a half months, but there is going to be that there. I mean, we, we both uh, have been wanting to do this trip for quite a while now. Various things happen over the years that prevent this, especially COVID, right? That was the big one that prevent uh, trips like this from happening. But we're finally uh, ready to, to 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 basically do it. And, and we're very much looking forward to it, very excited for it. But thought I'd give you guys the heads up about a month out in advance there. Now, moving on from that onto the bullish rant that I was going to go on about. So I have two tweets that I put out today that are related to this bullish rant. The first one is that it is probably the week that the ETH ETFs are going to go live for trading this week. I know that some people think it's going to happen next week, but this week seems obvious considering the fact that there is no reason for them not to launch this week. There are no more amendments to do on the S1 forms. Really, all it's up to at this point in time is the SEC to basically put the stamp of approval on it and that's it. They're live, they're ready to go for trading. All the issuers are ready, everything's ready. The market's ready for these things to start trading. There shouldn't be any more delays here. Now, of course, we know the SEC is no friend of crypto, so they could just delay it for whatever reason, but I don't know. Maybe I feel like that at that point, it's just being like extremely petty. And I feel like the issuers would get uh, very annoyed by this and would basically back channel to try and get these things approved. But I, I, I don't know, unless they want to be really petty, they, they being the SEC, these things should start trading this week. I don't know if it's going to happen today. It hasn't happened yet. Today being Monday, could happen tomorrow, could happen towards the end of the week. I'm thinking it's going to happen this week. Uh, pretty much everyone who's in the know with these things, with ETFs generally, thinks it's going to happen this week. But if it doesn't, maybe next week, who cares? Any day now, basically, but I'm making the prediction. Uh, it's not really like a prediction. It's more of just the, I'm making the, the bet that they're kind of, they're going to launch this week. So I'm super excited to see them go live because as I've said before, there is the two two main questions around the ETH ETFs at this point in time. How much inflows are we going to see and how much outflows are we going to see from Grayscale's ETH e products? And as I've said before as well, I feel like there's going to be more inflows than people expect into ETH, as a, especially as a percentage of BTC, and there's going to be less outflows from ETH e because ETH e has been trading at such a steep discount. Uh, sorry, not, not a steep discount. has been trading basically at fair value for almost two months, basically. And and the thing is, is that if you're dying to get out of ETH e and you want to sell into cash, you have had ample opportunity to do so without having to eat much of a discount. I think the discount's at like 0.5% now, and it's been kind of oscillating between that and and basically nothing. So yeah, I'm just not expecting to see see much outflows there. And I also think the timing of these ETFs going live is pretty good. I think we had over the last couple of weeks, a pretty big capitulation event within crypto where essentially people sold off all 
all assets. I mean, BTC and ETH obviously sold off, but the rest of the assets out there, the altcoins, they got absolutely hammered. A lot of them set new lows. Um, a lot of them went back to basically their lows from from the bear market. So essentially the market did a full reset there and people capitulated and you saw that with the price action that happened. ETH hit 2,800, I believe twice, and he's now trading at over 3,300. No reason we can't go back there, of course, in the short term, because uh, I guess like volatility will happen. But at the same time, it just feels like we're entering the next phase or the next leg up of this bull market, which is super exciting. And as I said, perfect environment for the ETH ETFs to launch into. So I will keep you guys updated on that, of course. Uh, and you'll see this before I even talk about it because the next refuel will be on Wednesday. So if it gets approved either today or tomorrow, you guys will see this, but I'm just very, very excited to see what the first month of flows looks like. That's my main kind of question right now as a percentage of BTC, but also just as a dollar amount. Like if there's billions of dollars flooding into ETH, into the ETH ETFs over the next month, I don't give a shit what percentage of BTC that is. That's a sh shit ton of money. That's a lot of new money going into ETH. And I'm I'm going to love that regardless of what percentage of, of um, the BTC inflows it is. I think that new money, you know, fresh money, new blood coming into crypto is always a good thing. Now, the other tweet that I put out in relation to this was just basically three main points around Ethereum and why it's really impossible to be bearish right now. The first point is Ethereum is scaling. Like we all know this, Ethereum is scaling more than it ever has before. The layer twos are on fire. You can use any of the L2s today and pay very, very cheap fees, fast, have fast transactions, have ample liquidity on a number of these things. Even the smaller L2s have enough liquidity for people who are fee sensitive. If you're not fee sensitive, you're going to be on L1. And the L1 fees aren't even that high either as well. I mean, they're three gray right now. Yes, that's probably like a dollar or $2 or whatever it is to trade on L1. But if you're that fee sensitive, you're going to be on L2 and like your size isn't going to be size. Like you're not going to be slinging millions of dollars of trades, right? Because if you're doing that, you don't care that you're paying $2 for a trade, right? So there is a, a size element here on, on that front, on, on the liquidity front. But regardless of any of that, Ethereum is, is scaling. And as I've mentioned plenty of times on the refuel, scaling is in the best place it has ever been. Contrary to stupid crypto Twitter narratives that like to go on about how Ethereum has failed or Ethereum is not scaling or L2s aren't really Ethereum scaling, ignore all that. That's all noise. Ethereum is scaling. It's executing on its roadmap and it is in the best place it's been in quite a while. The second main theme that is uh, very bullish for Ethereum at the moment is that the tokenization of everything is coming. As you guys know, uh, Larry Fink, BlackRock's CEO, is very bullish on tokenization. It's basically become one of the main things he talks about now when he's talking to mainstream finance publications. And then also we saw last week that even though it's on a private blockchain, Goldman Sachs is also getting involved with tokenization now. And as I mentioned last week, I don't think the private blockchain thing is going to last. I do think a lot of these corporations or a lot of these companies, a lot of these institutions will end up on public chains uh, at some point down the line. It is going to be a slower mover than we would like and that we are used to within crypto, but it is happening. The tokenization of everything is coming and it's happening in a really big way. And it's funny because this has been something that I think has been coming for quite a while, but as I said, TradFi, you know, the traditional world moves quite slowly compared to crypto. So it may seem like it's been talked about since forever, but it's really in the last couple of years that people have been talking about this in earnest. And especially when it comes to things like real world assets, like for example, stable coins are being the biggest real world assets as they exist today on chain, but there's more and more coming online and it's growing, you know, steady, slow and steady, but it is growing. It's not going to be like what we see in crypto where there's a billion dollars deposited into a new protocol because they're farming some Ponzi token, right? It's not going to be like that. These are serious institutions with serious money that are looking for long-term uh, capital uh, preservation, capital appreciation, long-term oriented products, not short-term things where they're farming some token that's going to go to zero because everyone's just going to dump it after the airdrop. Like they're not doing that. They're a, it's a different class of investor, different class of money, right? But regardless of that, the tokenization of everything is coming and it is, it is coming in a really big way, especially over the next few years. And then as I mentioned before, the ETH ETF launch is imminent right now. So it really is impossible to be bearish. And I posed this question in the Daily Gray Discord channel today, and I pose it to you guys out there as well. Please come up with just one. I'm only asking for one. I'm not asking for five or 10. I'm asking for one fundamentally bearish thesis on crypto generally, but on ETH specifically. Just give me one reason to be bearish over the next six to nine months. And it can't just be, oh, you know, we might have a recession. Like, I don't want that though, that kind of reasoning. I want a detailed analysis of a bear case for the next six to nine months um, for ETH and for crypto generally. Please, I, I can't see any right now. And I don't like that I can't see any because I usually think that there should be at least some some reason to be bearish in, in, you know, in the midst of all the bullishness. But right now, there are a million different reasons 
reasons to be bullish. From everything that I just mentioned to uh, regulatory tailwinds for crypto, not just with a possible change in admin, you know, you, I don't like to get into the politics too much, but hey, as I've said before, you know, crypto, uh, the Democrats have been so hostile towards crypto for the last, whatever it is, 18 months or, you know, whatever it is, that if the admin changes, if uh, the Republicans win and the, and the admin changes, immediately or almost immediately, the SEC is going to be completely different, right? Gary Gensler's gone. He's going to be replaced with someone else. Uh, the general makeup of the SEC is going to be shaken up. The regulations around crypto or any kind of, I guess, anti-crypto armor, any kind of attacks against crypto are going to be completely gone if and this is obviously um uh i guess like a, a reliance upon trump and the republicans sticking to what they're saying i was actually got into a little bit of a heated debate in the daily Gray discord channel the other day where i said that i don't like believing outright what people say especially not when it comes to politicians doesn't matter what side of the aisle that you're on doesn't matter what your politics are politicians are generally pretty good at either bending the truth or lying or spewing bullshit just to get elected and then when they get elected, they tend to go back on a lot of what they say. So I'm giving the good reality or the good scenario that let's just say Republicans win and then uh, they stick to exactly what they said they were going to do with regards to crypto. That would be stupidly bullish for crypto, honestly, because it basically means that we have at least four years of crypto being left alone from the government or mostly left alone. There will still be things here and there, obviously, uh, you know, the, uh, the president doesn't have uh, complete control over everything, but it will be a lot less hostile, like probably 90 plus percent less hostile than what it is today uh, with the Democrats currently in power. As we know, they're very anti-crypto, especially the SEC, especially high ranking politicians, uh, Democrat, uh, Democratic politicians and senators like Elizabeth Warren, uh, like um, uh, uh, Maxine Waters, like Brad Sherman, you know, the, the names that we see all the time. So, you know, that's what I'm talking about when it comes to, I guess, like regulatory tailwinds, the fact that we're winning in the courts against the SEC and against other regulatory bodies, but also that uh, if the Republicans do end up winning, which I don't know what the odds are of this happening. I mean, I'm an Australian, uh, I'm an Australian citizen. I don't uh, really have any insight into the US elections, but Hey, the, the, the prediction markets are saying that they think Trump's going to win. So if he wins, good for crypto. Uh, if he sticks to what he said, if he doesn't stick to what he says, then who knows? But honestly, the Democrats have been so anti-crypto and so hostile towards crypto that even if they don't, uh, the Republicans don't stick to what they said with regards to crypto, it would probably still be better than what we currently have. Who knows how it's going to shake out? As I said, this isn't about politics to me. This isn't about where you align on things. It's more about the fact that we know what crypto is, how or how crypto is going to be treated under a Democrat, um, I guess, presidency. Uh, we don't know what it's necessarily going to look like under a Republican one because the last time the Republicans were in power uh, was from 2016 to 2020, right? And that was a very, I guess, like different time for crypto. Crypto was much smaller back then. It wasn't in the mainstream consciousness. We didn't have big institutions like Black involved. I think for the next 10 years, at least, that's the mainstream mark of crypto. That really is the mainstream mark of crypto. And I think that we can't afford to have a hostile uh, government because it's just going to end, end up in roadblocks everywhere. And it's just going to be really shitty. There's going to be so much money wasted. So yeah, that's a huge tailwind, guys. Like honestly, it is really, really bullish if that was to happen. If they win and they stick to what they say, really, really bullish for crypto. So anyway, as I said, can you if anyone out there can please find me just one reason to be bearish on crypto over the next six to nine months. And I don't think a reason to be bearish is that the Democrats win again and they continue their anti-crypto hostilities. I don't think that's a reason to be bearish either because during the entire period that they've been hostile towards crypto, it's been up only after, like after obviously it bottomed, um, obviously uh, for the year 2021, we had the bull market, Democrats were in power, we had the bear market in 2022, and then it's just been, for the most part, up only. So I don't think they've had much effect on the prices. So I wouldn't even consider that to be a bear case there. But as I said, if you do have one for me, please let me know on, in the YouTube comments or in the Daily Great Discord channel. I would love one, uh, a bear case on ETH and crypto generally, because I'm just not seeing one right now. All right, moving on. So Justin Drake has tweeted out that their based pre-confirmations are now live on the testnet Helder. And there has been a lot of people and companies and entities within the Ethereum ecosystem working on this. And I think that he has tagged all of them in this tweet, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. But you can see, uh, I mean, there's a lot of teams here. And there's also he's also grouped them into what they're responsible for. So you can see here that the execution pre-confs on base rollups were being done by Puffer and Tyco. Then you can go, 
down and see um, the, con the the registration contracts were done by Spire Labs. I'm just picking out random names here. The relays and gateways were done by Titan Builder and Ultrasound Money, so on and so forth. So many teams and people working together to make based pre-confirmations a reality on testnet here, which is really great to see. Now, I know there's been a lot of discussion around uh, based rollups and pre-confirmations recently. There are a lot of concerns around pre-confirmations and around how they can potentially uh, um, centralize things around uh, possible MEV, I guess, uh, negative MEV externalities. But generally, I think that based rollups are a really, really sound idea, sound primitive, where essentially you're using the L1 validator set to process transactions so you can have essentially the, the same security and decentralization guarantees as L1 has and censorship resistant guarantees. But the drawback to that, as I've explained before, is that because L1 slot times are 12 seconds, it, you could be waiting up to 12 seconds for your transaction uh, to process. So the UX goes down a lot compared to the existing L2s, which have a sequencer that will process your transactions within one second or less, essentially. That's where pre-confirmations comes in, where essentially pre-confirmations is this crypto economic primitive that uh, essentially tells you, okay, well, I'm going to pre confirm your transaction in less than a second and then I'll promise you with some economic promise that this will go lie uh, this will be put into a block on Ethereum L1 uh, within a timely manner usually within like that 12 second slot window there so essentially the end user gets good UX of, its, of their confirmation sorry, of their transaction confirming within one second or less, but it's still not you know, confirmed on chain for those 12 seconds or up to 12 seconds of those slots there. But as I said, with pre-confirmations, even though they're a very cool primitive, they're still relying on, relying on crypto economic guarantees, not cryptographic guarantees. And also it, it can be centralizing because there are different entities such as uh, the relays or, or in the gateways that can, be, uh, that can be very centralized like what we have with um, the relays with MEV boost today and the builders within MEV Boost today. So there's a lot of work still on to on figuring out how we could potentially decentralize that. Obviously, as I mentioned last week, there's a lot of talk right now as well about uh, lowering Ethereum slot time to two seconds. This would basically fix this issue completely because it would essentially mean that you would only have to wait a maximum of two seconds provided you paid the right fee to get your transaction included. But it as I mentioned last week, it presents with a lot of different issues as well because of the fact that bringing the slot times down slot times down to two seconds breaks a lot of things on Ethereum today because Ethereum today exists with the assumption that slot times are 12 seconds and not two seconds. So it would obviously have to be done in a gradual rollout. Maybe we would lower them to 10 seconds, then eight seconds, and then you know keep lowering them. I don't know if you even know if that would be possible to do or how hard that would be to do, but maybe that's something that ends up being done in a couple of years time because yeah, that, that basically alleviates all the centralization concerns because then you don't need pre-comps essentially. You only, like based rollups are able to get their transactions included with the right fee paid within those two second slot time. So there's no, there's not, I mean, you could have pre-confirmations if you want even faster uh, confirmations there. But at the same time, uh, the problem with that becomes that uh, now the pre-confirmations are competing with just normal L1 confirmation times. And it becomes a game of, can these pre-confirmations offer such a better UX to give up the, you know, the guarantees of having your transaction included just normally on L1 remains to be seen. But regardless, a lot of work on this, a lot of work across this entire stack from a lot of different teams, a lot of different um, entities, a lot of different people here. And you can go check all of them out for yourself if you would like. Uh, Justin Drake has linked them all in his tweet. Which I'll show for you, uh, which I'll share for you guys in the YouTube description uh, below for you to check out. All right, so this is one for the solo stakers out there or the aspiring solo stakers. Now, a lot of you may know about Queen Cashew. Uh, they do uh, guides for various different things within the ecosystem. They have a really, really good Ethereum solo staking guide. Now, this is the one that I have followed to set up my solo stakers in the past uh, and it served me quite well. It is very straightforward. They explain a lot of different things. It's basically copy pasting commands into uh, the, the, the terminal and away you go. I mean, I've not really had any issues with these guides before. But what I realized or what I discovered that they had released recently was an even easier way to get started with, um, you know, they say here node management or solo staking on Ethereum. They've got a new piece of software called ETHPillar. Now, this is a nice little graphical user interface uh, that allows you to essentially set up all of the necessary infrastructure that you need to become a solo staker on the network. Now, you can see from these screenshots what this looks like. Essentially, you, you boot this up. It's a nice little interface here. It's not like a full graphical user interface that you're used to within something like 
like Windows or Mac OS or uh, Ubuntu, for example, but it gives you a nice little interface within the um, the command line itself. Now you can run this on Mac and Linux, I believe, uh, Linux, I believe, but you can see here what this looks like. So essentially you just run through the steps, you get your execution client set up, you get your uh, consensus uh, client set up, you get all your validators set up, you, you set up all the necessary stuff, like getting your validator keys done, depositing the, the, the relevant ETH, getting your um, uh, JWT store done, making sure that you're securing the box correctly with the firewall with and uh, making sure your, your time's in sync with crony, all that sorts of stuff that you would normally do just manually, you can now do or, uh, mostly automatically, even setting up things like MEV boost using this ETH pillar software. So if you are someone that hasn't spun up a uh, a solo, uh, a solo staking setup yet, or maybe you just want to run a full node, I do recommend checking out this piece of software. You can download it. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, uh, a direct link to it, uh, because you'll be able to essentially just get started very, very easily. And as I've said before, you can run a full Ethereum node on very low powered hardware. If you have a Raspberry Pi lying around and you have enough storage space, I think you would want to have at least two terabytes uh, of storage space connected to that Raspberry Pi or a Rock 5B or even an old laptop or something like that, right? As long as it can be online 24-7 and ideally connected to an Ethernet port rather than Wi-Fi because it's more reliable, then you should be able to run a full node just fine. And as I've said before, it doesn't require ETH to run a full node. It's completely free to run a full node, at least the software. Obviously, you have to buy the hardware and pay for um, the internet electricity and all that, but it, it, it doesn't cost any ETH. And of course, if, you want, if you've want, if you been thinking about um, spinning up a solo staking setup, well, honestly, I would highly recommend this. This is probably going to be one of the easiest way to do it if you want to do it on, on your your own hardware on your own. There are obviously other easier ways to do it, such as DAP node, which also provides a graphical user interface that is probably simple. Uh, it is simpler than what this is, but you buy the, the you know, you, you obviously buy the hardware and then you install DAP node on it and it's a different piece of software. So that's probably the easiest way to do it right now. But if you didn't want to do that and you wanted something that was a bit easier than the command line, but, but not like, you know, super noob friendly and you still wanted uh, uh, to have that full control over things and you still wanted to learn how it all works, all the ins and outs of it, then I highly recommend going in and checking out ETH Pillar. Um, I've just uh, checked out the screenshots, read through the docs. I haven't set this up myself yet because I've already got all of my nodes set up, but I do plan on playing around with this on one of my spare Raspberry Pis that I've got lying around. I've got like 10 of these things. I, I bought a lot of them because I, I found some sale once that were clearing them. I think it was the old one. Um, and then they've just been lying around and I, I normally I get them out and just test different things on them. I basically, I uh, was playing around with, um, I believe it was Pi Hole, which was essentially, uh, what, what, what was it? I'm, I'm forgetting what it was now, but I, I believe it was a way to uh, essentially uh, configure your DNS at the, the router level using using Pi Hole or essentially, no, it was an ad blocking thing. So essentially what it would do is it could have an ad blocker uh, between your uh, uh, network and all the devices connected to it. So instead of an ad blocker on a device by device basis, you would have an ad blocker uh, basically at the ingress point um, of, the, of the network. So essentially the network feeds into the pie hole, uh, your, your internet feeds into the pie hole, whatever website you want to view on it, and then it just ad blocks it at that at that level there, at the network level, which is which is really cool. I mean, it worked for a while, then it stopped working, and, and for some reason I never went back to it. And it does tend to break things if your network's rather convoluted and you've done a bunch of different custom stuff to your network, but I'm getting off topic here. I, I just have a lot of them lying around. I like to do things on them. So I'll probably check this out at some point soon, but you guys should do that as well. I'll link this in the YouTube description uh, below for you to go check out. All right, so as you guys know, ETHCC took place recently in Brussels, uh, and of course, there was an ETH Global conference right after it, or an ETH Global Hackathon right after it. And as of July 15th, yep, as of today, basically, the finalists uh, were announced. So you can see here a list of projects. Uh, there is no winner of ETH Global events. They always have 10 finalists. So you can go check this out. Um, I'll link this in the, in the YouTube description below. Uh, but essentially, there are a lot of interesting projects here. I think that there's no real kind of main theme to the projects. There are uh, different things doing kind of different things. So essentially, there's one playing around with Uniswap v4 hooks. There's one doing AI stuff. There's one doing stuff with NFC. There doesn't really seem to be any main theme here, which is really awesome to see because usually at these hackathons, you'll have someone building or you have you have the finalists, like most of them building something in DeFi or most of them building something on, on layer two or most of them doing something with ZK. Whereas uh, this one seems to be varied. I don't know if that was done on purpose or if that's just what 
people wanted to build over over the, the hackathon here, but you should definitely go check out all of these for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. You can go to each of these pages. They're actually really good pages because they show you everything and they give you a link to a live demo and the source code. So you can check out all of this for yourself and judge for yourself which project that you like the best, which one you find the most valuable because sometimes uh, these projects go on to become real, actual, live you know, uh, uh, funded projects that you can use on, on mainnet here. Um, but a lot of the times, obviously they're just done for the hackathon, but still it's, it's really cool to see what the next generation of Ethereum builders are thinking about and what people are building here, because there is obviously this perverse narrative for some reason within crypto that we don't have any apps that people use. And then I kind of look at all the growth that's happening on, you know, across the whole ecosystem really. And I'm like, but people are using them. And then people will say, well, they're only using them because they're airdrop farming or they're farming something here, farming something there. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so like, is that not usage? Like, I, I, is this not what we're building here? Permissionless systems for people to use however they want? Like, no one says that someone is only depositing money into a bank account that's offering a teaser rate or that, you know, that no one talk, says, says that they're just farming the teaser rate, right? That's just an incentive that people uh, are giving to you for depositing or that the bank's giving to you for depositing money in there. Now, whether you stay or not is up to you and up to really the bank to entice you to stay, but no one calls it farming the yield. No one calls it just going there to get the um you know it's saying oh it's not usage or you're not using that bank because you're just uh you're just farming that bank or whatever it is it's just such a weird thing within crypto they just, people just come up with these convoluted narratives for some reason and it, it just astounds me especially because like if you're logging into crypto every day if you're checking crypto every day you're on crypto twitter you're checking the prices and then you're just bearish on this whole industry and you say that we've got no users you know the prices suck everything sucks whatever like why are you even here like it just why would you waste so much time like it's just stupid like go somewhere else and do something more productive than just being here every day being bearish like i don't know it's just something that i've noticed especially over the last six months it's just this cohort of people that it's, it's some kind of mental illness that they that they do this i don't i don't understand it really um but i know that doesn't apply to you guys because you guys wouldn't be watching the refuel if you were just perma bearish on this industry but yeah just something that i've i've noticed and it, it's just very weird there but anyway enough ranting about that i think that's going to be it for today's episode uh but yeah i think i'll be back on wednesday so wednesday so thank everyone for listening and watching be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet give that a thumbs up subscribe to the newsletter join the discord channel and i'll catch you all on wednesday thanks everyone